residential housing accounts for 38% of all construction volume. The great news for the U.S. housing shortage is that construction is projected to boom over the next five years. Driving this is a couple things. First, multi-billion dollar federal and state government investment in real infrastructure. Second, and this one is significant to today's guest, increased demand for modular and prefab. What does it all mean? Well, it means rising opportunity in multifamily development and construction for those with pipeline and process. Today's guest is someone who has both. Tom Tomaszewski has spent a lot of time getting ready for just this moment. Tom is president of the Annex Group with offices in Indianapolis and Chicago. Annex has developed thousands of apartments spanning affordable student and workforce. Here's what you need to know about Tom. He likes a challenge. I think that's an inherent requirement of NAHB. I'll have to check with Dean on that. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm very happy to be here. Tom, by your background, it would seem you were born to develop degrees in public affairs and construction engineering management. You follow the engineer's call through problem solving. What else do we need to know about you and Annex? Well, fortunately, uh, I'm backed by a very uh, wonderful team, and you know we really have a mission to create a positive impact on the people who not only live but also work and uh, are involved in the communities that we develop in. So, um, you know, we're not only about building buildings and, and, and building apartments. We really want to create a, a community and, and become a catalyst for the communities that we enter that are traditionally underserved for for housing and in need of affordable housing. So, we are uh, very happy to provide that uh, service for communities. The Annex Group works in cost-sensitive sectors of multifamily. How has the run-up in materials prices affected your ability to meet project goals? That is a great question, and uh, it has been extremely difficult, uh, especially lately. Um, you know, with the the pandemic and and all of the changing, uh, uh, you know, everything that has been changing and the different uh, supply chain issues, uh, the price of everything has literally gone up. And obviously, lumber uh, people have heard about uh, continuously, and that's been one of our our bigger challenges. But we've had to uh, uh, really. Uh, continue to be creative and really know our product and, and actually kind of uh, hone in and, and get really efficient at what we're building. Um, you know, we kind of continually build the same thing over and over with, uh, you know, our buildings are always different, but we have a lot of the same unit types and uh, we're putting the same materials uh, in, in each of these units, whether we're building in, in uh, Kansas or in, uh, in Indiana or in Montana, you know, we're using a lot of the same products. So we know our product and we can kind of, uh, Get ahead of any of material shortages and, and any uh, any cost increases. Um, also, when we're designing our buildings, we really look to make them as efficient as possible. So um, we're looking to get the most uh, rentable space possible versus common space. Uh, and then we also uh, have a few other things that we work well in our favor. Um, we, we we do develop and we also build our own products. So we're the general contractor where we have a lot more control uh, versus using a third party uh, uh, general contracting firm. And then we also own a lumber company uh, and are fortunate uh, with, with uh, how things have gone lately with the lumber uh, shortages and, and the price rises. We've been able to, uh, you know, stay ahead of things and buy at opportune times and really control our processes because we own the, the lumber portion of our, our, our uh, uh, company that builds our products. So uh, we've had to really get creative and, and really uh, work on execution and delivery. Uh, another big portion uh, that has helped us quite a bit, and this is where NHB has been, a great help in their their advocacy is uh, you know last December we were able to get a four percent rate lock uh, on the low income housing tax credit which was a, a boon for our industry and really has allowed us to continue to move these projects along and, and given us the capital to to be able to do so so I really applaud uh, NHB and their efforts and and being able to be advocates for our industry so it's it's just it's been very difficult but also uh, we've certainly been welcoming the challenge. You own the lumber that sounds like Forest City back in the day. <laughs> That's how they began. Yeah, I think absolutely. it was in the 20s. There you go. So yeah, maybe we're on the right track, hopefully. Construction labor has tightened since COVID. Are you having a hard time finding workers? Yeah, so that is that has been a challenge, and it's really been a challenge since since 08, 09, when our last uh, you know in the last recession, you know, we had people that left the trades to go to completely different industries, and it's it's been difficult uh, ever since then. And COVID has just exacerbated exacerbated that uh, that topic. Um, so we've had challenges. You know, we've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of the same subcontractors and really stay ahead of it and kind of foster good relationships to make sure that we've got our jobs properly staffed. Um, another thing that we have uh, found challenging but also 
um, incredibly rewarding is to work in our internal team and to build uh, extremely talented individuals uh, that want to work for us and want to really uh, create lasting effects on the on the projects that we build. So um, by really growing and focusing on our internal staff and and you know um, really paying a lot of attention to that, that has kind of helped us on our on our projects in general to allow to kind of head off some of that uh, uh, lack of, of workforce. And really, you know, we have a lot, lot of creative problem solvers that way too when we have good people working for us. You build portions of your projects offsite, Tom, and bring in the modules for assembly. How key is modular construction to achieving cost goals? So it is something that we've been very interested in, and we actually, uh, uh, one of our first student housing projects was built modularly 10 years ago uh, in Carl Sandburg College uh, in Galesburg, uh, Illinois. So uh, it's something that we were successful on on a project, and fortunately uh, at that project we were very near to a modular plant and, and partnered up with a company called Homeway Commercial, uh, and we're very successful. Um, since then we've had it, we've, we've found, we've tried to work it in many different ways and are finally uh, now coming to a point where we think it's going to be very positive and and uh, have been recently kind of discussing things with a company called Rise Modular out of uh, Minneapolis, who's been doing some really unique things uh, in the city of Minneapolis uh, modularly. So where we think it's gonna be successful and where it's going to work is at, in high cost construction areas uh, that are very tight and have tight timeframes. Uh, so it's something that we have uh, spent a lot of time on. We've been successful once at it and are looking forward to uh, implementing in, in the future and are working with some some individuals to do so. Uh, however, in the interim on our current projects, which are being built, so a lot of things are built uh, offsite and, you know, things like the panelization of wood, uh, of the wood walls, a lot of times are built in a factory and then brought to the site. Uh, sometimes uh, the plumbing assemblies are assembled in, in a shop and then kind of brought out. So what we're seeing is a lot of individual things uh, as a start to kind of, uh, you know, and a move to more modular, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, you know, so uh, it's something that we're very excited about and, and really working hard on or kind of using some things currently and have been successful in the past. Um, we need to work on uh, getting um, that builder network in those factories where, where we're not transporting mods 700 miles to where it kind of gets really difficult because that transportation cost adds up. But uh, we are seeing some people be very successful at it and uh, we are, are looking at that um, in particular, uh, potentially, uh, you know, more of an urban market uh, setting where, where the costs are a little higher and um, we can get the project done in a shorter period of time with less dis disruption. The rising modular company, Katera, recently filed bankruptcy. Where did they go wrong, Tom? So uh, Katera is an interesting case. And, uh, you know, they, they got in, uh, were well, uh, well back financially, and it seemed like um, there were, you know, some tech tech investors and tech industry people kind of coming into the construction industry and they really uh, wanted to be a disruption and really recreate everything. Well, I think they went in and tried to do too much. Uh, you know, they kind of went in, uh, wanted to do everything, wanted to go ahead and, you know, acquire all these companies and just grow rapidly and, um, you know, basically create something that was spit out of a factory and it was always going to be consistent. You know, let's say if you're, my, if you're building a snow shovel, you're always going to be manufacturing the same snow shovel. Well, when you're building a building, no building is the same. Uh, every job site is different, uh, whether it's just your conditions underground, your transportation. So what they tried to do was, was create something universal that would fit everywhere. And it just did not work in construction. Uh, and I don't think that they had the right uh, construction people involved. And uh, I think they just over overthrew things and uh, really kind of threw a lot of money at it because they were well capitalized and it just kind of fell apart and they were unable to deliver on their promises. So I think it's just a combination of being over, uh, over, uh, you know, going in a little too far and, and, and not having the right people and right, uh, um, the right people to do so. Getting over your skis. Exactly. You said that 3D printing, speaking of customization, can significantly reduce construction costs. Most 3D printing projects today are relatively small. How long before 3D printed structures are used in the construction of multi-housing? I would love to see it sooner, but I do think it's going to be quite a while. Uh, it does seem like on a smaller scale and it, it does kind of start and it is, it is starting to, to work. Um, and about 15 years ago in one of my grad school uh, courses, I had a professor show us a video of a uh, of a machine and it was just a diagram of a machine going in and, and basically 3D printing concrete houses in a, in, a, in a development. He said, listen, someday in 20 years, this is how things are going to be built. Well, you know, 15 years later, it's not quite uh, realized, but it, this has been something that's been around for a long time. 
I don't know. Um, it seems like it's still got a little ways to go before it's, it's uh, used on a larger scale or multifamily level. Um, but I do think that there, that for ultimately there will be something that disrupts the industry um, and, and makes quite a change. I'm not quite sure if it's 3D printing or not, but it could be, it does have the potential to, and I'm you know, certainly interested in seeing how things progress. Well, give us a prediction. What do you think will be the first application? Um, I've actually seen, I believe they are doing a 3D printed multifamily building where we're talking a couple of units in an urban core uh, somewhere overseas. So I do think it's already happening, um, but on a large scale um, where you can do 50, 60 plus units, you know, we're probably still 10 to 15 years away, would be my guess. You've done a lot in student housing. How did distance learning affect the sector's pipeline? So uh, distance learning and uh, COVID in particular uh, did, did, did affect things. Um, um, we did, uh, the industry kind of went a, a little crazy initially, which just like everyone else did when we didn't know exactly what was going on. Uh, they did anticipate there being a lot of, of issues and vacancy and they thought that people wouldn't be paying their rents. Uh, ultimately, it turned out to be not as bad as, as anticipated and, and uh, collections and vacancies uh, were not terrible. They were a little higher than, than normal, but uh, not too bad. Uh, now, coming back this year, it, see, things have kind of normalized and gotten back to somewhat pre-pandemic levels. Uh, there are, is a little bit more difficulty in, in leasing it, it, to some extent, but we are pretty on par with prior years. Uh, your higher tiered uh, flagship schools had less of an issue with uh, some of your tertiary and smaller schools having more of an issue. Uh, but we are seeing things get somewhat back to normal uh, in, in general. And we've, um, you know, we've actually gone away, uh, we made the conscious effort about three or four years ago to kind of move away from student housing and to focus more on affordable. Uh, so we really are very happy that we kind of did so in, in, in this time frame when the pandemic came about and there are some more uncertainties uh, going forward with student housing. So we are very fortunate to really be focused on multifamily, uh, affordable and, and workforce and really kind of moving away from student housing, uh, fortunately. It's always great to get new, good news and it sounds like there's more to come in the years ahead. Thanks for joining us, Tom. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a new day in development. Technology continues to change the world, including construction. Modular, prefab, and 3D printing are just some of the automated processes promising to change the speed and cost model of residential assets. And innovators like Tom Tomaszewski are leading the way. I love commercial real estate. That's where the nation's brightest innovators have always been through history and today. And especially in our great country, genius is a spark that catches and spreads. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our show. I'm Linda Hoffman. See you on our next exciting episode of NAHB Power Hitters.